this is Rock River Arms. We're in Kelowna, Illinois. My name is Steve Mayer. I am the Law Enforcement Government Sales Manager as well as the New Product Development Coordinator. Establishing what you're going to do with it first. Uh, lots of calibers, lots of sizes, lots of shapes, lots of configurations available. Um, over a hundred different makers right now of different products. Some are very similar, some are very diverse from one another. It's just really identifying what you want to do with it. If you're going to the range, if you're going to go hunting, and if you're hunting, what are you going hunting? Are you going prairie dogging? Are you going to go deer hunting with one of the larger caliber platforms? Boar hunting? I mean, it kind of depends on what you're going to do. If you want to be a tactical applications, a three-gun match shooter, law enforcement applications. I mean, there's, it just varies a lot of what the different things are you can do with an AR platform rifle. This is what we would call a lower half. Lower half comprises the lower receiver itself, the fire control group, certain other controls, a stock with the recoil system in the stock, and a pistol grip. This is the magazine well where the magazine would go into here. Stock, the, the lower receiver, even though it's the firearm under the law because it has the serial number on it, really doesn't do much in the rifle. It never sees the, the cartridges, it never fires anything. It's more of a platform for holding on to the other stuff, like the stock, the grip, and the trigger group. All the real function takes place in the upper half. Uh, we happen to use two-stage triggers in ours, most of ours. It's a distinctively different feel than a single-stage trigger. You know, it, it's inert right now, even though it's in the fire position, because the hammer is forward. If you were to cock it, which the rifle does on its own when you're firing it, which I just did manually, you have two distinctive stages in a two-stage trigger, hence the name. You have the take-up, which is the first stage. It's almost all the travel and very little of the weight. You'll encounter a hesitation in the pull that you can hold against like I'm doing now. You can pull through, which would be the second stage with the let off, or you can release and reset the trigger. But if you pull it slowly and easily, you can hold on target like this and wait for it to pop up. Say you have a prairie dog in his hole, and you're waiting, waiting, waiting. It goes for it. You're really not supposed to do that and let it dry fire up against the magwell. But you'd have here, and then the second stage is a let off. is almost no travel, but most of the weight. So it, what it really does is fools your mind into thinking that you have a shorter, crisper trigger than you really do, because you've already taken up all the slack. You're holding against that stop. And then when you do want to fire, it's just there. You want to squeeze it and... Most makers included a two-stage trigger or a match trigger as an upgrade. We use it as a standard in most of ours. We have different weights. We have different uh, settings on them uh, for varmint-type rifles, for tactical rifles, for match rifles that need different weights and different settings to get by the, you know, the, the, for the rules under which you play generally. The stock is a real simple system. This happens to be an A2 rifle stock. Uh, there are all sorts of stocks out there, collapsible stocks. Uh, in some models, you can do a folding stock variant. It just kind of depends on the recoil system that's in use at the time. They use a recoil buffer and spring, which is the actual recoil absorbing part of the rifle. So that explains why my nine-year-old shot one, how, why he enjoyed shooting it so much. Yeah, I mean, it absorbs the recoil for you. A lot of guns, like bolt guns and stuff like that, people are more familiar with. You're the recoil absorption on it. You have to suck that up in yourself. This is the recoil buffer in the spring. I'll show you the bolt carrier in a few minutes with the upper half. But the bolt carrier comes rearward, hits the bump, the buffer, which collapses the spring further, 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 further back. And then it rebounds forward to push the carrier forward to strip off the next round off the magazine and chamber it. Now, it's only a quarter of a pound. That, that buffer weighs about four ounces. But with that spring and everything else, that's a lot of the recoil being absorbed by the spring. It captures it and then rebounds forward to chamber the next round. It's doing a lot of the work that your body is doing in, the, in a bolt gun or a manual action gun. This is the part that has to be registered. Serial number's right there. Next part would be the upper half. And this part you can buy anywhere. You don't have to... It can ship directly to you. It's not registered. It's not serialized. You know, it does the majority of the work, but it's not the actual gun according to the ATF standards or Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosive Standards. This is the receiver itself. That's 7075 T6 aluminum, just like the lower was. This is the charging handle. This is the carrier group. A lot of people don't understand this. This is a bolt and carrier group in one process. It comes apart, but this is the bolt. It pistons within the, the carrier group, and the carrier group is what travels rearward Hits the buffer that we already saw, 
causes it to rebound recoil and then comes forward again and strips off the next round from the magazine. Real easy gun here. Field stripping an AR style rifle is really easy. I'm just using a pen because it makes it easier. Firing pin, retaining pin. Dummy firing pin for our display guns. This is called the cam pin. It's a little rotating piece that kind of holds everything else together and makes it all function. And it is oily, and I am not getting a very good grip on it. Oh. Of course, it's always the one I'm trying to show people with. That's the other thing is people want to do these guns dry, and we prefer them to be a little wet. Cam pin is out. This is the bolt. Carrier group is just a steel carrier. It carries the bolt, chrome-lined interior. This is the carrier key. These are the carrier key screws. People talk about the staking on these. It's just the tools that are used to hold it in place to keep it from being able to rotate out or walk out. You stake the screws, you pin them so they can't move on their own. This is the bolt, this is the workhorse. This has got your extractor on it. It's got your ejector in it. It's got your gas rings. Uh, it's got your locking lugs that go into the, the barrel extension. This is the thing that does most of the work on the, on the rifle. There are chrome lined versions of it or chromed versions of it. There are versions that use a, like a titanium nitriding or a uh, tungsten disulfide. You know, there's all sorts of other coatings that you can put on these for various, make it easier to clean, make it slicker, make it different color, whatever it happens to be. But for the most part, the bolt is gonna be the bolt. There's not a lot to change on the bolt itself. I should get it. And that goes forward. Firing pin goes back in. Got to get this in the right position because, again, it's oily. There we go. When would you ever need to take this? Take one of those apart. Just field stripping and clean it after you're done shooting. And that's about as far as you would ever normally go on your own. And that's just to clean the bolt, clean the carrier, get the excess oil off, get the carbon off of it, and you'd just put it right back in the upper. And you would take that apart every time after shooting? Ideally. I would, yes. Ideally, I mean, you don't have to, but ideally you would. If you're using corrosive ammo, if you're using uh, a lot of that steel cased uh, ammo that uses a uh, lacquer on the cases, you want to get that off and out as soon as you can. Get it out of your gas rings, get it off your system. So yes, you wouldn't. This is the charging handle. Replaces like a bolt handle on a regular firearm. Little T with a locking mechanism and a latch, spring loaded. It just fits in a track in the upper receiver. Carrier fits right down into it. Some people are gonna ask what this is. It's the forward assist or bolt forward assist. If you, for whatever reason, and in most circumstances, if you can't get your bolt to go home and close on a round, you're just gonna pull the charging handle, eject that round, try a different round. But for some applications, you're gonna to want to, or you're gonna be stuck with your bolt partially open and you wanna get it around. There's a little cam and you can actually force the bolt closed with the forward assist. It assists it to go forward. This is the port door over the ejection port, just primarily to keep dirt out. Because when the bolt is back, that's right into the guts of your rifle. Or when the bolt is closed, your carrier pretty much seals it up, but they still port door. This is a free float handguard. It's common on a lot of our variants. That's an aluminum tube around a barrel. The idea of floating a barrel is to isolate the barrel from the outside forces of you putting your hand on here or your bipod on here and resting the rifle on it. If you do that on a normal handguard, which is connected here and here, you're going to flex the barrel a little bit. No matter how minutely the impact of it is, the pressures that you're changing on that handguard are going to cause a deviation in what was formerly the, the sight alignment. So now your sight and your bore are slightly off from where it was. Mm. The idea being to isolate your barrel and the sights on the barrel from the outside influences on the handguard so you maintain your accuracy. This is a stainless barrel. 
This is a uh, mid-length uh, stainless steel, 16 inch. Uh, mid-length refers to the gas system and the handguard length. Mid-length in this case is nine inches. Mid-length refers to the differences in the gas system and the handguards. Normally you want to cover your entire gas system with a handguard. So in this case, it's a nine inch handguard covering a gas tube that starts right about here, goes all the way up front and is into here. And that's the way the transfer of the gases that are generated by firing it Gases follow the bullet forward. Bullet passes the gas port. The gases that are left behind it are sucked up through a gas port in the barrel into this gas block. Gas block has the gas tube in it. Gas tube transports the gases back here to cycle the action. Again, the gases would come into this gas key, down through into the bolt, the bolt gas ring, seal it, and that creates the rearward momentum that causes it to cycle. Yeah, it was. I was set up by a guy named uh, Eugene Stoner in the late 1950s, working for Armalite, which was then a division of Fairchild Aviation. The AR-15 design got sold to Colt piecemeal. The whole thing went to Colt, and it became the Colt AR-15 M16 series. Uh, that's the fundamentals of the rifle. This is the lower half. I'm putting the upper half on the lower half. The beauty of the AR system is the modularity. You can buy one lower, which is, again, the rifle, the, the firearm, and you can put multiple upper receivers on it to do different things. You could have a tactical version, you could have a hunting version, a varmint version. This was the pivot pin. I just inserted it. That is what the rifle pivots on. Where's the pivot pin? Right here. It just went into the upper, the lower and upper are now joined together. This is as far as you would normally go for cleaning purposes. You can still get all this apart with it still together. And then I'm pushing it together, and this is the takedown pin. This was go in and out to allow takedown to the point where you can disassemble, and it's in. Show me the takedown pin. Right here to right here. Again, those two pins are what hold the upper half to the lower half, and all that's necessary is to push those pins to the right, take the upper half off, put a new upper half on, and you're back in business with essentially a different rifle.